OK, let's continue on. Sort of with the last topic of, of this class, there's another lecture for after the break that's just more kind of emerging stuff like high-speed imaging and whatnot. But in terms of the last diagnostic, uh, we're going to talk about spontaneous Raman scattering. So this kind of ends our session on scattering. We did Rayleigh scattering, uh, filtered Rayleigh scattering, and we'll look at spontaneous Raman scattering. There's certainly many other scattering processes, stuff uh, that I didn't cover. So again, what, what is it that we want to cover in this uh, lecture? We want to think about it in the context of species measurements in flames. Uh, talk about the difference between rotational and vibrational Raman scattering. A Raman scattering theory, which is, again, we can call it an extension of Rayleigh. It can be derived on its own, but we can just use what we've already learned. And really look at sort of the, some of the more challenging, at least in terms of flame uh, measurements, is in the data analysis. Okay, it's a little bit of history. This always tells you why uh, you, you want to be, uh, I guess, uh, well, not everyone who does things first are always uh, remembered. So if you're big into laser diagnostics, obviously, you know, the Raman effect and the Raman scattering, well, it was first uh, predicted theoretically by Adolf Schmeichel in 1923, largely forgotten. Um, but in 1928, Raman uh, discovered this effect and uh, ultimately uh, won the Nobel Prize just two years later. Now, that never happens now. No one ever wins a Nobel Prize like two years after they do something now. But again, that tells you how influential the effect was at the time. The, this kind of inelastic scattering of photons uh, was also uh, Mendelstam and uh, Landsberg did this independently in crystals around the same time. Didn't quite have some of the uh, bugs worked out. But again, kind of the nice idea, Raman's experiment was a monochromatic light from just a lamp, passed through water and some ice, and, and, and looked at this kind of inelastic effect. And so that's kind of the history of what we're going to look at is this uh, inelastic scattering. Okay. okay, so again, we're now very familiar with Rayleigh scattering. Okay. We know that it's not species specific but it gives us only information on number density. But Raman scattering actually gives us an opportunity to measure individual species in combustion environments, at least if they're simple species, things that we typically deal with. And again, again, if we have simple hydrocarbons and it separate out what CO, CO2, and fuels, as they become more and more complicated hydrocarbons, uh, it, it can be difficult uh, to understand what you're looking at. But in context of what we general look at and say fundamental turbulent combustion uh, work, uh, we can get measurements uh, of major species. And the reason we can usually get just major species is it's really weak. Again, it's about a factor of 1,000. We'll show this in the cross section. It's about a 1,000 or more weaker than Rayleigh scattering. So you need to have a lot of, of the stuff. Uh, and so it typically you can see the fuels, but you can see all these major species. This is a nice complementary measurement to LIF where you can measure the minor species. Again, it's, you don't really get access to these major species with LIF. So again, you get a different set of information. Now, often uh, Raman scattering, again, if we think about what we'll talk about, kind of the take home product, which is vibrational Raman scattering or row vibrational Raman scattering uh, is often combined with Rayleigh scattering, okay? If we combine the two, the Raman scattering, you know, in kind of like a bit, this is an iterative process. The Raman scattering will ultimately give you the species. The species will help you correct the mixture average cross section, which will give you an accurate temperature in any configuration. The temperature can be used to quantify the Raman. So it's an iterative process. So if you have a simultaneous Rayleigh Raman scattering measurement, you can actually get all major species in temperature quite, quite nicely. Okay. So we also know that there's uh, just a tremendous need to measure species in our combustion. So this is kind of the, the motivation. We talked about cars. Uh, again, just briefly in lecture one, we did not do any in-depth uh, lectures on this. Uh, conventional cars, as we talked about a bit, if you have uh, nanosecond or picosecond lasers, you can actually, you can measure one or two species, but not all of them. You don't have enough bandwidth, meaning you don't have enough spectral coverage. But I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I just wanted to highlight that 
these sort of new ultra fast approaches that have been coming out over the past you know five plus years uh, from people both at Sandia, AFRL, et cetera, have really demonstrated the possibility of measuring uh, species uh, with these femtosecond approaches. So in addition to what I'm going to talk about today with spontaneous Raman, since you, got, you guys are students, you're the emerging researchers, these things are the ones you're going to want to pay attention to. These are the type of techniques that are going to become uh, that, that you're going to want to adapt or, or you know, even make the next take to the next level. So this is an example uh, from uh, just uh, two combustion symposiums ago, uh, Chris Cleaver and, and Andre Streisler's group at DLR combined this measurement to do 1D imaging of temperature major species near a wall. So this is kind of nice. They're looking at heat near wall flame interactions. And they looked at this very nice uh, using this femtosecond cars uh, imaging type approach uh, to do 1D measurements of the species. So again, uh, as you get some time in your leisurely reading, go look at these papers. Okay? And why do we want species? Again, why in the world am I talking about Raman anyway? Accurate species are really needed to understand the thermochemical state. Temperature in minor species cannot tell you the entire story. Uh, so you really want to see, again, where fuel's going, where, pro where the products are being formed. In addition, uh, we talked about this a little bit, uh, but if you measure all the major species, again, let's say you measure the major species, uh, again, this can be any elemental fraction, okay? And then you can get something called the mixture fraction, which gives you the state of mixing. So once you measure all the major species, the minor species don't add up to much, so the major species can tell you where all the carbon, hydrogen, or the majority of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms are. Okay? And so by knowing the major species, you can induce the mixture fraction. The mixture fraction gives you the state of mixing in a non-premixed or partially premixed flame. And so in non-premixed or partially premixed combustion, this is the governing parameter to characterize uh, flames. Yeah. So now into Raman scattering. Uh, let's go back just a little bit to an intermediate result from lecture 11. We saw that we had both this Rayleigh term, again, uh, we have our P vector here, our induced dipole, and we have, uh, we have our Rayleigh component, we have our Stokes and the anti-Stokes. So, and we call these, you know, Stokes, Raman, anti-Stokes, Raman. Uh, we see from this kind of description that the Stokes and Annie Stokes line will have the same intensity. This is, uh, should not be the case, or it's typically not the case. Again, we had talked about where the Annie Stokes and the Stokes come from. Remember, the Annie Stokes is one that's already in excited state, and then it comes back down to the ground state. So it, it implies that its initial population is already in excited state, so there's a lower probability of this occurring. And so what happens, the Annie Stokes line should be, uh, should be weaker. So the ratio of these two intensities should be governed by Boltzmann distributions. And so this gives us uh, a ratio of the anti-Stokes to Stokes lines. It's all based on the population that exists in these various vibrational states. Okay? And we'll come back to this in a little bit. OK, let's start by looking at rotational Raman. Okay? We've kind of zoomed in. We just finished uh, looking at all of the different components of the Caban's line. Now we're going to zoom out a little bit and look at rotational Raman. Okay. So if we go back, our brains back to where we started to introduce scattering in lecture 11, okay, we know that in general, the induced dipole does not have to lie in the same direction as the electric field. Okay, remember we ended up having that P uh, was purport, the induced dipole was proportional to electric field uh, when they were symmetrically uh, symmetric scatter, that was just a scalar alpha. But for any general case, uh, the polarizability was a vector. Okay, so the pol uh, sorry is a tensor, uh, and so we end up uh, writing it in this manner. We did this for Rayleigh scattering. Okay, we, that it had to be a symmetric be a three by three mat matrix. So. Let's simplify the way we think about this for a moment, okay? The polarizability tensor can be simplified by changing the principal axis 
So some of you hopefully are familiar with the fluid mechanics, the principal coordinate system. We can change our coordinate system. So this is just a molecular coordinate system. Uh, so all we're going to do is uh, rotate our coordinate system so it diagonalizes uh, the, polar, the uh, alpha. Uh, polar's ability. So we're just lying on an axis that's aligned with this, okay? And so we're, we're kind of, we're going to follow the polar's ability uh, tensor for a bit, okay? So for linear molecules, again, we don't need to do the derivations, but let's just write these as that now the component that's parallel to electric field is now alpha z, and the component that's perpendicular to the direction of the uh, electric field is, is x and y, okay? And so it's parallel to the z-axis. Remember, we're aligned for our simple orientation, or our orientation, our electric field's aligned with the z-axis. So we end up getting our mean polar's ability equal to this term and our anisotropy term. Remember, we in in defined and introduced all of these in Rayleigh scattered. Okay. Now, we also talked in general terms that, and especially we did this from the context of vibration, but any internal motion could modulate the induced oscillating dipole. So really, it's, it's always easy to think about vibration, right? I send an electric field that has, some mod, that has some frequency, right? And then I have some much slower frequency, the vibration of the molecule. And if they couple, I end up putting the slower vibration onto, essentially add this onto the oscillation of the electric field such that the light I get out is in a slightly different wavelength. You know, that's offset by the vibrational frequency. Well, we can have this exact same thing for rotation. This kind of general expression is valid for rotation. But we can look at the rotation of the molecule a little bit different, okay? So let's see if we can think about this. So we know that our molecule now is rotating. Okay, let's just say, let's don't add three-dimensional. Let's just think it reminds us things rotating, right? We got, a, we got two masses connected by a spring, and they're just rotating, okay? Now, when the incident electric field uh, hits this molecule that's rotating, okay, the polarizability uh, and the electric field are actually, the polarizability presented to the electric field changes. Remember, the polarizability of a molecule is its tendency to be perturbed by the electric field, right? If I'm rotating and I have some electron cloud, then technically whatever distribution of electrons I have are actually changing with respect to my electric field, right? My electric field's coming in, but the molecule's rotating. So over the course of that rotation, its polar's ability or its ability to be perturbed is actually changing, okay? So the polar's ability uh, changes with rotation. And so we can say since the x, y, the, the electric field is still in the original x, y, and z axis, but we've now aligned ourselves such that we're on the polar's ability axis, they end up, they're, they're aligned, they, they, they're aligned differently throughout that rotation cycle, okay? So the best way to think about this is that the polar's ability is in a molecular coordinate system, and our electric field stays in a traditional Eulerian coordinate system. So that through the course of that role, the polarization uh, essentially modulates by the frequency of the rotation, okay? So what happens is the induced dipole, which is due to the polar's ability, remember this is, again, just the ability of the molecule to be affected by the electric field, the induced bipole has to be modulated, okay? And, and thus the scattered light is modulated, and this is due to the rotation. So it's all because of essentially the orientation of the electron configuration or the ability to be polarized for the molecule is changing with respect to the electric field during a rotation cycle, okay? And so you end up getting the scattered light comes out on the frequency, the oscillation of the laser, plus now a different rotational transition. So think about it in the exact same way is that the vibration modulates it, the rotational frequency, which is much faster, adds, uh, adds information, if you will, to the, to the frequency information of the actual electric field, okay? So, in order to have, observe rotational Raman spectra, what that means is that the anisotropic portion of the polarizability tensor needs to be zero. If, the, if these two are equal to one another, then the polarizability stays the same with respect to electric field 
uh, during the entire rotation cycle and there's no new frequencies uh, put on. Uh, there's, no, there's no modulation of the electric field frequency. So now if we go back to this, okay, let's go back to our Rayleigh scattering cross section with 90 degrees observation. We actually now can pick out that this in isotropy factor that exists. Remember, this is actually, at the end of the day, this turns out just to be the major portion of the cross section. We end up getting uh, from this term. Uh, this in isotropy factor arises from the emergence of the rotational Raman uh, component. So it has to do with the rotation of the molecule with respect to the electric field while it's undergoing a polar polarizability, while it's being polarized by the electric field, okay? So this anisotropy factor is, uh, is actually part uh, of the Rayleigh scattering cross-section, but it's due, it's coming from the rotational Raman, okay? So again, your, your Rayleigh scattering cross-section, everything that's in the literature of this is the size of a Rayleigh scattering cross-section, uh, have rotational Raman information in them, okay? You can set them out theoretically, if you want, and you, in theory, can separate them out experimentally, even though it's very difficult. So now let's go back and look at sort of our definition. Quote, unquote, Rayleigh scattering, going back to what we did in lecture 11, our Rayleigh scattering is the gross line plus brillion scattering plus rotational Raman, okay? Now, also in lecture 11, where we introduced uh, general scattering, we stated to have a vibration Raman effect the polarizability had to change. Remember, the partial alpha over partial Q had to be non-zero. So the same type holds for Raman. So now we can say that for a molecule to be Raman active, this is kind of the selection rule, is a molecule must have an anisotropic polarizability. Okay? So as it rotates, if, it, uh, if, the, if, the, if the electric field sees the same effective polarizability the whole time, it's not Raman active. And this is what you have in a symmetric molecule or uh, atom in, in a near symmetric molecule. Okay, now to save you guys, we're not gonna go through any derivation of selection rules. Uh, again, if you're really into, go to spectroscopy books, look at the selection rules, but delta J is zero, okay, Q branch, and then plus or minus two for linear molecules. So it really, it's an effective two photon pro process. A single photon puts in the vertical state, virtual state, a second photon emits it. As a point of nomenclature, the delta J equals zero is many times reported as Rayleigh scattering because that would imply no frequency shift, but this is actually an unresolved Q branch, which we're not going to talk about because the, ro the Q branch rotational Raman actually comes from a slightly different phenomenon as well. Uh, go read uh, Dick Miles, the 2001 MST paper. Very good uh, paper if you want to know all these different aspects. Okay. So now we can say that if Rayleigh scattering are co was, you know, was the Caban's line plus rotational, et cetera, our, co our Caban's line can now be written as the gross line plus Brillouin scattering plus Q branch Raman. Okay? Now, if we assume a rigid rotator, we know that from our basic spectroscopy lecture eight, that's the rotational energy. And then you already have all the skills to go through and pick out where all the frequencies are, okay? You already know how to calculate all those in just by using your selection rules of plus or minus two, and you go calculate them. And here you can see what the shifts are, okay? And that gives you whatever your, if we're talking about pure rotational Raman right now, that's going to be your laser frequency, plus this is the Einstein B coefficient, this is your absorption coefficient, and this is your spacing for J plus six. Now, just to be a little bit more accurate, I just want to, this is a page where you're just going to see the entire page. This is a new page of equations. I wanted to give this to you in case those of you who start working in kind of Raman and you want to actually be able to calculate these things. Um, if you want to add a better approximation, if you add the centrifugal distortion, your delta, uh, your shifts uh, are written. This is for the Stokes and this is the anti Stokes, okay? And so these are actually what they look like. And then when you plug everything here, we're not going to go over this. I just want to leave this with you. you you'll get this when, we, when I, I'll send in all the updated slides. So you actually now can compute a spectra. And let me explain. You have all of the shifts. This is the intensity of a single line. Looks a lot like uh, Rayleigh scattering. C, I naught, N, I, except 
Now we have to have Fj here. Fj is the Boltzmann fraction. It's the population in whatever state J you're looking at. And this is your differential Raman scattering cross-section. Okay? Dj is your degeneracy of that particular quantum state. We again have our, the energy of that particular rotation state. We have the partition function. Okay? And then these are your cross-section, and these Bs are plasic teller factors, but they're all tabulated and calculated for you, and this is the anisotropy. Okay? So this is like the worst possible teaching method is to throw up 10 equations and say, you got this, but now you just have it as a resource. That's what I wanted you to have. Because with all of this, this is all you have to have, and you just go look up these constants, and you can actually go and calculate a spectra. You don't need anything else. Okay? Uh, so once you have the constants, you can put it all together. So uh, you can, again, look at work. The Q branch intensity turns out to be about one-third of the cumulative, or is one-third of the cumulative Stokes anti Stokes. And if you put all that together with no hidden uh, information from the previous slide, you can actually calculate uh, pure rotational Raman scattering. And with what we've done on Rayleigh, you can actually determine the Caban's line and the Plasic trace. So let's take a moment to look at actually and all these things we've been talking about very generally, like, oh, when you hit it, you get out of spectra and it contains X, Y, and Z. Now you can see spectrally is really what it looks like in a quantitative basis. These are calculations I did. These are differential scattering cross-section that shows uh, changes in wave numbers from minus 300 to 300 wave numbers. We have in the middle here, we have the Q branch Raman. Okay, that's that unresolved delta J equals zero line. We have the remainder of the Plasic trace. So this right here is your Caban's line. And these were in log space, that's why they look this way. And then we have, we have all our rotational lines, and it's the degeneracy that gives you this operating, uh, uh, this oscillating between odd and even J lines. Okay? A couple things we can see about this is we can see the peak rotational Raman signals, if you will. This, excuse me, the signal will go as the scattering cross section is about, if we look at this, at least two to three orders lower, and even the Q branch, which is the strongest individual branch, is about one and a half to two orders lower than the, uh, than the actual remainder of the Caban's line. So it only composes about one or two percent of your Rayleigh scattered. Okay? We'll take a look at that in a minute, and that's species specific. Now, if you want to look at what they look like for different uh, species, forget about the black line. Uh, this is a plot. Uh, where we did this with a certain bandpass filter. But, uh, but what I want you to see is these are all species specific. If you look at the blue, that's the same nitrogen set now in linear axis. And this is the rotational Raman calculated for carbon dioxide. And there's two things you should see here is it's much, CO2 is much stronger just in terms of a cross section. It's about a factor four stronger, okay, four to five. And they're very heavily congested, okay? And so they're even closer to the, to the central line. Now, why do I bring that up? Now, if you, going back to the previous lecture, if you do a filtered Rayleigh scattering measurement, uh, you are going to collect, in general, the, if you do a filtered Rayleigh scattering, you're going to collect the rotational Raman, both the Q branch and the pure rotational Stokes and anti Stokes shifted. Because even if I have my iodine cell on, that, that blocks the central line and has intermut structure throughout, but it's not going to, it doesn't block the rotational lines. And even then, if I go and put an optical bandpass, like I said, if you put on something that even has a few nanometers, that's going to be tens of wave numbers. So you're going to collect, in general, a lot of uh, rotational Raman. I said, okay, let's say we don't try to block any of the rotational Raman. Uh, what does it look like? Well, here we go. In general, this is about for a filter Rayleigh experiment, you're going to collect 1% to 2%. That's all of it is. So it's really within the uncertainty of your measurement. Okay? Now, the, the one that does violate this is carbon dioxide. It's about 10%. 10% of your signal at cold temperatures of a filter Rayleigh is actually due to rotational Raman. Okay? So, if you want to describe it, you need to be able to model it as well. So when we do FRS measurements and the models that we build up, they actually have all these rotational Raman uh, spectra and models put in as well. So that's just kind of a word to the, the wise. Okay. Now, now 
we talked about this earlier that the rotational Raman transitions are embedded uh, onto uh, vibrational levels, right? So really, uh, the rotational structure is going to be superimposed onto the vibrational Raman spectra. Okay, so there's certain selection rules again, uh, but if we go back to our very simple uh, harmonic approximation, uh, we now have our, our vibration energy, uh, just normalized uh, by 2 pi, I believe. We have our sort of our harmonic oscillator, we have our uh, correction factor. We now can determine the specific positions of all of the transition frequencies by adding the rotational Raman, again, this is the one with no centrifugal distortion, onto the vibrational positions, okay? So if you look at this, really what this says is our S, this is our Q, Q branch of each individual vibrational transition, right? So this is V naught, we get shifted by whatever our vibrational frequency is, and that sets up the zero position, that would, that's like V naught, and then each one of that we add on our S branches, okay, in, in, in negative frequency space, and we add on uh, the O branches. So for each time we have a new vibrational position, we distribute a series of rotational lines around it. And that's exactly what you get here. So let's, this is the figure, looks a lot like what I just showed you for pure rotational Raman, correct? So we have the exact same, we have the combines line, we have pure rotational line now. Okay, so right here is our laser at 532. That's new laser, invert it, and you get about 1,878 wave numbers. Now we move over to our first vibrational band, second vibrational band, third vibrational band, and distributed amongst each one of these species, sorry, our first vibrational band, this is second for CO, this is first for N2, first for water, and then they, they can have second, but they're gonna become exceedingly weak to where we can't even see them. So right now, let's just look at, we have first vibrational band here, and then distributed around each one of it is the actual rotational Raman on each vibrational band. So this exact same structure that's around uh, the Kibana's line is distributed around each one of these vibrational structures. And then if we went higher to over here, I mean, they would have really low intensity, but if you had the second vibrational and third vibrational, you would keep doing that. It really depends on where they, where they are. Something like CO2 is a little strange that they, they, they're very close like this. But what I want you to see is that you have this rotational Raman structure is superimposed, and this entire thing is referred to as a row vibrational structure, okay? Now, you can also see the big difference in, line, in signal strength. We move down from pure rotational Raman, okay, let's say we're one, two, three orders. Now we move down, now another one, two to the vibrational lines, okay? Now, we do have to integrate all of these up, so it's not like you get six orders of magnitude and signal, it's about a factor of three by the time, since you have a little single line here and you get all of this different contribution in spectral space. But you can see how much the signal decreases, okay? And so again, it typically goes that vibrational Raman spectra is about a factor of, of a thousand less than Rayleigh scattered. Hmm? Okay, so the intensity expressions that we develop for Rayleigh scattering can be applied to the vibrational Raman effect as well. If you remember, we looked at the perturbation in, in the, uh, uh, just that very general, we wrote the polar zero, polarizability expansion about an equilibrium position uh, for Rayleigh scattering. Uh, we do the exact same thing uh, for Raman scattering. Uh, again, some results from vibrational spectroscopy allows us to rate, uh, to relate these uh, quantities. This is just a known expression. But we want to jump to kind of what the signals look like. Okay? The Raman signals, again, look very similar to the Rayleigh scattering, they, again, they have the mean polarizability, the anisotropy, except these have primes, and these turns out these are derivatives, okay? Uh, and so that's a little bit different uh, because we need movement about an equilibrium position. Let's uh, see, we, we have our similar type expressions. We have partial derivatives with respect to its position, its uh, spatial position, and again, mean polarizability and isotropy. Okay. So if we look back 253, 
this is the expression for a single scatter, but the exact same thing holds for, as in Rayleigh, we can actually get our total Raman signal is just by considering summing up everything that exists uh, in the probe volume, okay? But now we also have to take into account that we have population, the same as the rotational Raman, where we could only have a certain amount of population in each J, the same as we did for laser-induced fluorescence, we can only have a certain amount of population in each vibrational state as well, okay? So we have to, we have to consider those effects as well. And then you end up, uh, for our case of linear polarization, let's say we have vertical polarization laser light, that's what we typically will use. We put our camera at 90 degrees to the probe volume, and for only Stokes uh, scattering right now, uh, Annie Stokes has done very similar, we end up with this expression, okay? So again, this implies that if we want to say that our scattering is just proportional to a differential Raman scattering cross-section, this is now the definition of a Raman scattering cross-section, where our Raman scattering cross-section changes uh, as uh, each vibrational frequency. But you see the exact same thing that you see for Rayleigh is this new to the fourth power, okay, which is also lambda to the minus fourth, okay? And again, all it is is now, instead of just being a pure new, it's the differential between the laser and the vibration. But the laser frequency is much, much larger than the vibrational frequencies, so you can take this as the laser frequency to the fourth power, okay? So the same thing as Rayleigh, you have this, depend, this uh, uh, new to the fourth power, okay? Now, you can also see within this definition of the vibrational Raman cross-section is that everything uh, the vibrational frequency, we, we know that's species specific, right? But A prime and gamma prime vary for each species as well. So the scattering cross section is species specific. So Rayleigh scattering, this is the biggest difference. Rayleigh scattering is not, right? Rayleigh scattering is from that volume, okay? If we, the individual Rayleigh scattering cross section, right? Um, the Rayleigh scattering cross section, sorry, let me, let me back up. I, I, I completely butchered that. Uh, the Rayleigh scattering cross-section changes for each species due to the polar's ability of each species, right? In here, we have the polar's ability, but we also have a vibrational. So the scattering cross-section, similar to Rayleigh, is species-specific, but it's also frequency-specific. So um, we're on our last day. Uh, so. so it's certainly a species-specific, but it's also frequency-specific as well. Okay, so then if we collect our signal over some finite collection volume, we end up with this expression. Again, very similar expression to the Rayleigh scattering uh, uh, signal. So now it's good to take a look at this sort of in comparison to Rayleigh scattering and look at the fact that we, we know, even through my blunder, we know that both Rayleigh scattering and Raman scattering are species-specific. But now we're going to look at this in terms of we have these different Raman shifts in there as well. So if you look at the Raman shifts because they change for each species, that's what I was really trying to muddle my way through is for the Rayleigh scattering, there is no Rayleigh scattering shift, right? There is no shift. They occur at the same, uh, so that's how you can't tell them apart. But with Raman scattering, they all have a shift. So they all end up in different uh, uh, different places in the spectra. The other thing to look at is kind of here's again the size differential. These are vibrational Raman cross sections. These are right, Rayleigh's cross sections. Uh, write these in 10 to the minus 10 to the 31 versus 10 to the 28. So these are again uh, much larger. Okay, and you have to multiply times 10 to the 31 to get to here. So they're not. These are these value times 10 to the minus 31. Now there certainly are very large uh, species. Uh, in here. Um, again, for example, methane uh, has very large uh, Raman cross-section, vibrational cross-section. So the other thing to point out is that the ratios of the Raman cross-sections do not correlate with the ratios of the Rayleigh scatter. So if you know a certain Rayleigh scattering cross-section, let's say ethylene to, to nitrogen, right, looks like it's about five, and I think it's 5.2 or something like that. If you look in 
Uh, ramen, it's a bit bigger, six or seven, but methane, uh, methane's a good example. The Rayleigh scattering cross sections of methane to nitrogen is like 2.2. And again, if you're looking in terms of, it's about a factor of six in ramen. So they don't, they don't necessarily scale. All right, let's just now talk about how you implement these things. Ramen scatter measurements and flames. So here's a depiction of the lab at Sandia National Labs, uh, state of the art, okay? Uh, four, sorry, four lasers that are combined and stretched in time, so you get a tremendous amount of laser pulse energy. Remember, Raman's very weak. Uh, they're combined, they're overlapped, so you have this long temporal pulse and a lot of energy, and then it's going to come through, do your, uh, have the Raman effect. Uh, this light is collected through optics, very high collection efficiency optics, and put through a spectrometer, okay? I won't go in that. And this is in general what a measurement would look like. Again, these measurements are done in general on a line, so a radial profile. It basically, again, your line comes in and then it's dispersed through a grating that exists inside the spectrometer. So this is your line. Again, look, this is a jet flame. This is the distance from center line. So this is the radial or the transverse position. And then this is the spectral coordinate. So again, each one of these are the same line in physical space. But again, you can see near the center line is where you would, if it's a non-premix jet flame, you would expect to have all the fuel, right? And then you would expect to have nitrogen and oxygen out in the co-flow. Okay? And this, in the middle, you have all your different intermediates. So let's talk about how you perform, just in general, how you perform a measurement. In, in general, you use a high, it can be performed with any laser. We know that. We've talked about how the Raman effect is not, uh, it's not a resonant technique, but it's weak. So typically, single shot, uh, met, for single shot measurements, you're going to need very high energy pulse lasers. The most common is the second harmonic of the, of, of the YAG. You, uh, if you're putting a lot of energy uh, into a focal point, you, you can break down okay, so you can spark the gas. So typically, another complication of the experiment is that you'll put it through a pulse stretcher. Okay? You put it through a pulse stretcher that essentially beam comes in uh, and you split it, send part through, send the other to rattle around, and you keep delaying portions, if you will, of the beam till you stretch it out temporally. You lower the peak power, but you keep approximately all of the energy, okay? And so you don't break down uh, the gas, but you can still have all of the energy. So, but this is another complication that typically comes with a spontaneous Raman type measurement. There are multiple ways of doing this, moving from kind of old to new, okay? You can have, you have point measurements to where the light would come in, Right, laser would come in, uh, excite, and you would collect the light and send it through either a polychromometer, and then you would send it to individual photomultiplier tubes that are all filtered to collect just a certain uh, bandwidth. So you'd collect right at the laser, get Rayleigh, and you'd isolate all these different lines, right, which is a series of PMTs, and that was a whole bunch of point measurements. I uh, then started moving to uh, measurements uh, using imaging spectrometers and cameras, and kind of the latest and greatest are these uh, type that are done by Sandia that uh, attach that have both the Rayleigh camera and the Raman camera integrated into a, its own custom unit. Light comes in, it's chopped by a really a wheel that's moving. Not this is slow as a fast moving, like at 21,000 RPM, and then it ends up the light comes in through a series of Camera lenses to change your magnification, and it's dispersed. And they get really high quality, high quality one-dimensional Raman data. Okay. So here are some examples, uh, and I have a very similar type spectra. So uh, more challenging. Sandia did hydrocarbons. I have some examples from hydrogen flames, but I wanted to show that to show you kind of the difference between a nice hydrogen flame and uh, even going to something like CH4, which is a tremendous leap in complexity, okay? Uh, you have, first you have, there's large variations in concentrations in a flame, right? If you think about the difference between nitrogen and let's say CO, the peak CO may be 5%, the peak nitrogen is like 80%. 
And then they have big differences in cross sections. So you can end up, it's really a big dynamic range problem. And then also you get these, you can get significant interferences with hydrocarbon flames. Okay, you have more species transitions and you actually even get fluorescence interferences. You have all these things called PAHs, uh, polycytic aromatic hydrocarbons, these kind of larger hydrocarbons that are soot precursors, even if your flame is going to be non-sooting, you just get these large hydrocarbons. In a hydrogen flame, you don't have that. Chemistry is pretty simple, right? So you get these well-isolated Raman lines between water, oxygen, nitrogen, you know, sorry, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, water. Here's vibrational water. Actually, the nice thing about kind of Raman when you do this, you can actually get the rotational hydrogen. The rotational hydrogen bands are so far away, uh, it's an anomaly because it's such a light molecule, that these are actually rotational bands that have been pushed far away, while all the other rotational bands you know, are sitting just a few wave numbers away from the laser. These are thousands and thousands away. So uh, anyway, the hydrogen flame's quite uh, simple, uh, or no, it, it's simpler, uh, and, but then this hydro, even moving the methane. Moving into even higher hydrocarbon fuels is a challenge. Uh, there's not too many measurements done at flames with fuels even more complicated than methane. For example, DME is one that's amenable to, uh, dimethyl ether is amenable to Raman diagnostics. There's been a little bit done in ethane uh, type flames, but really n not a whole lot of very useful measurements in hydro hydro higher hydrocarbons, mainly because this interference level starts to become significantly uh, too much to deal with and how to make a quantitative measurement. Okay, let's look a little bit at quantifying uh, the measurements. Uh, to measure the species we want, we really need to put that entire vibrational distribution on a, a thousand pixel camera, right? If we're saying that this is a sensor, sorry, this is the length of a sensor, we need to put all this spectral information all on this, uh, on this uh, line. So clearly this is a resolution problem. If we only have a fixed number of pixels and we have to put 3,000 wave numbers, then we only get about we get, what, three wave numbers per pixel or something like Well, that clearly we're not resolving anything spectrally at that point. So, so what you do is you, we end up seeing typically a strong signal from the Q branch and some diffuse scattering. And really, the biggest thing I want to talk about is that on a single pixel, you get contributions from many species because their spectra are, you, we're not resolving all of this you're basically, you're putting a lot of this information on a single column of pixels, right? And so you end up getting, a lot of these end up bleeding over to each other. Believe it or not, these two features, this is NO and N2, but CO, look, CO2 and CO2 are very close. When you start losing the resolution, there's no way you can separate out this information from, in just your original raw spectra, okay? So you get something that's referred to as crosstalk. So not only is it a challenge to acquire the data, remember, photon levels are really low, okay? You're using experiments that's high power lasers, we have to stretch the amount of time, we have a spectrometer, all these things, it's a very complicated just acquiring the signal. The even more effort is spent in data analysis, okay? So there are three primary methods for reducing Raman signals to quantitative measurements. One is called spectral fitting. So uh, this has uh, uh, kind of really been formalized by Dirk Geyer. Uh, and so what happens is imagine you have, you calculate all of the theoretical spectra of the rho vibrational Raman transitions, okay? And then what you do is you somehow in, your, in, a, in a numerical method, you convolve on the effects of your actual experimental called an apparatus function. So you have to sort of measure that kind of the throughput of your system. Then what you do when you measure a spectra, you basically fit the experimental data with all of these spectral libraries. And you end up trying to determine a best fit. And once you determine a best fit, you use those concentrations as your result, okay? Well, it's difficult to do because you're fitting under-resolved information. Now, there is the matrix inversion method. Bear with me, it's not nearly as complicated as the number of lines that are devoted to it. 
You have Raman signals and interferences are integrated across fixed spectral regions. And I'll describe that in a minute. It's just really what it is, it's bin pixel regions on a camera. So you're getting whatever, whatever you're collecting that if you have a certain column vector, certain number of pixels in spectral space, whether it's real Raman signal or it's interference, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just a signal vector, right? And it's related to the number density and its calibration is something that's called the CIJ, okay, which is a, which is a crosstalk matrix, okay? So let's look at this. You, any signal you collect is proportional to the number density. Any, sorry, any signal of species I is proportional to the number density subject to the constraints that part of what you're collecting is not what you want. And you'll see this in the matrix. So what we have is diagonal matrix of, of this are the Raman responses, they're the actual Raman information, and CIJ, the off diagonal, are crosstalk between Raman channels, fluorescence interference, luminosity, et cetera. Now, each one of these have a temperature dependence, and they're worked out through detailed calibrations and represented as polynomials. So you have to use lots of laminar flat flames, gas flows, it takes a very long time this is how it was done at Sandia for a really long time. Uh, and it's very detailed, time-consuming calibration. And the way you get it is once you've determined this matrix, which I'll show what one what looks like, you invert this equation via iteration, and you get the number density. Okay. The last one is kind of a mixture of both. It's a uh, this is what's uh, is probably being done, I mean, was the most recent method of being done. This is the matrix inversion process. It's based on the same general idea as the polynomial, so it's the hybrid. But what you do is you end up, you take these spectral libraries and you determine all the temperature dependence. Instead of calibrating every possible thing out, you actually do the calibration of the temperature dependence within the spectral libraries, okay, and then bend those to emulate your experiment. Okay? And then so what you end up with uh, is something that just needs to be calibrated at a point or two. Okay? And so let's show a little bit how this works. Calibration, all the matrix elements must be calibrated. Okay? So uh, we get an element-wise multiplication of these different factors. Remember, the on-diagonals are going to be the Raman response. The off-diagonals are going to be the crosstalk. You get these from the spectral libraries, which is from you have to have a very nice Raman code. And we calibrate them in just a few in, ambient air in a few ranges just to make sure that they're all, uh, you know, you, you take in certain optical collection factors, et cetera, of your experiment. Okay, let's step through how you do this so that you, when you're going back, you'll have this pictorial diagram in your head as you're going back to look at the different steps. Okay, the first thing you're going to do is say, okay, if I'm interested in these number of species, okay, including interference channel, let's say I need a channel this is a background channel and pure things that are just hydrocarbon. I know they don't exist anywhere else, okay? Then I have CO2, O2, CO into hydrocarbon, water, et cetera. So you define your N number of species and N background. So you have a total number of just integrated channels that you're looking at. So you're looking at one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And you're, that's what you're interested. You can bend all of, but this is your sensors, so there's discrete pixels all through here, right? There may be 1,000 or 2,000 pixels in here. So you bend them all together to essentially integrate them all into these big chunks, okay? And then you calibrate uh, with cold gases and lambda flames with known species composition. So you do all of this, and you generate this type of metrics. Here's your signal response, all the things that you want, okay, oh, sorry, all the things that you measure all of the things that you want, and here's your basically determined matrix. Raman response, like if you look at the on-diagonal, S is equal to CO2. And the, all these off-diagonal components are your crosstalk. Those are things that you have to remove. Those are extra signal you're getting that are not proportional to the number density, okay? But all this comes through calibration. And then they're all temperature dependent, but you have your temperature from your Rayleigh measurement. So you go through this and you iteratively solve this, and you know, it's, it's a process, but that kind of gives you an idea of how it goes. So let's look at an example calibration. This is a uh, laminar flame, uh, Hankin flame, near adiabatic flame. 
if you initially guess that every matrix, every element in your matrix is one, that means whatever Raman signal measure, you, every, whatever signal you measure is proportional to the number density, right? And then you go through. So if you do that, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, first of all, I always say the black circle, the black line we'll call truth. That's the adiabatic solution, and this is an adiabatic flame, right? Once you do that, your very first measurement is this red circle, and this is your oxygen, this is your water, uh, sorry, this is hydrogen, this is water, this is nitrogen, uh, and the, these are temperatures just determined from the Raman measurement and the Rayleigh. So you see that you do a really bad job the first iteration, okay? So what you do is you go through and you tweak the elements in the calibration ma matrix based on measurements in your ambient and a number of other flame conditions. And then you come back and look at the setter, second iteration, which is green. So this time you had an undershoot, now you have an overshoot. But now hydrogen looks pretty good. Nitrogen's fairly reasonable. There's green for you in the back. And the temperature is starting to get reasonable. The matrix elements are then adjusted via addition calibration again. And the matrix is inverted again and again. And by the time you get down to the fourth, you have a pretty reasonable agreement uh, over all equivalence ratios, over all species, and over all temperatures. So what you've done is you've optimized your experimental setup and your detection system for these calibration constants, okay? So there's still your optimizing. But then once you do that, you take that matrix of CIG that you've determined and you take it to turbulent flames. You don't touch them and adjust them again if you do your cheating, right? You know what I mean? So, these are, these are, it's okay to calibrate under known conditions, you just can't calibrate in the measurement that you're trying to, there's a circular process there, you can't calibrate in the measurement you're actually trying to get an answer, because that implies you already know the answer. So that, it's not a really good way to do it. So you take these measurements and you uh, port them to turbulent flames, okay? So how, how good are the answers? Let's say you do this calibration. Typically, the accuracy and precision of the method is examined by looking in near adiabatic flames that are different than your calibration conditions, right? So we will call near adiabatic flames as a known answer, right? And here's an example uh, in a Hankin burner uh, where the calibration were done in other conditions, typically only a few pure air, which is equivalent to zero, pure fuel, and then just a couple points on here. And then you make measurements all throughout. These are each little dot. These are clusters of single shot measurements. And you can see the precision of the type of measurement that you can get from this if the calibration is done right. So example applications. The most common application is in laboratory scale flames. Again, this is out of Sandia, Rob Barlow's lab, where with what you end up getting are very high quality measurements of the major species, CO, CO2, water, and hydrogen. And again, because you know all the atomic composition, or at least the majority of them, you can get the mixture fraction, okay, and then you can actually start looking at your measurements, and the dash lines are comparing with different model, uh, uh, model answers. And so now you can start, you have databases that can be used to look at and examine turbulent combustion models. Uh, they have been applied in, I would say, uh, DLR does an outstanding job, German Aerospace, DLR does, Wolfgang Meyer's group does an outstanding job of taking a lot of these, uh, of these diagnostics and applying them in very tough environments. This is a case where this is actually Raman scattering in a model gas turbine combustor, so enclosed, so it has windows, uh, so you have to do some other stuff with the, the beam, uh, it's swirl. Uh, very complicated environment. Uh, these are some of the measurements uh, that have been made, sort of what's called the outer reaction zone. You see results that are very close to adiabatic equilibrium. The so-called inner reaction zone, which is, again, lots of measurements near adiabatic equilibrium. But in this intermediate zone, you have a tremendous amount of local extinction, right? You have all these samples that are away from what you would expect from flame. In fact, all these value temperature, very low values of temperature showing flame extinction. So again, these measurements are very useful not just to say, hey, can we make this measurement? You actually can learn a lot about the processes that are occurring. We can learn that where you have very stable combustion and very unsteady combustion where the flame is just being re ripped apart and extinguished. 
And that's it for, for Raman scattering processes. Are there, there any questions? None? Rotational or vibrational Raman? No? You guys are all ready to go back and apply them now. Right? <laughs> okay, well, we'll take another 15-minute break, and then we'll, we'll finish up. We'll meet back at 4.30.